Hey guys, my name is Alan Leistico and I'm the youth pastor for Core Student Ministries and I'm so honored and thankful that you have dropped by our channel. If you could do me a quick favor, can you hit that subscribe button down below and also take that little bell icon so that you're notified every time we upload a new video and also every time we go live. Every Wednesday night from 6 to 7 p.m. we live stream our youth worship service. And if you want to stay connected to us and you want to see what we're all about, Come join us for our live stream. Come join us for worship. That's one of the best ways to get to know us. Now, let's head over to our video for today. Many doubted we'd ever see it, but here it is. The return to glory. Stain. It doesn't confuse Leo Messi. Sir Isaac Newton.
are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your carefulness. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing the pressing you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground you are breaking you. Uh, I hope you speak through Alan and you know what's on our hearts and minds. You know what's going on right now and uh, Hi guys, go ahead and have a seat for me. And uh, hey, can we uh, just give a, a quick round of applause for our tech team? Um, you know, they, they work uh, they work hand in hand with the praise band. Here's your keys. And they work really hard and, and uh, they're kind of perfectionists. And so when we have technical difficulties, I know it bothers them um, that it's not working the way that they wanted it to. So uh, yeah, guys, thank you for your hard work and putting all this stuff together. We greatly appreciate it. Um, Hey, Jules, uh, anyone who's watching, I'm going to go silent here just for a second. Jules, can you hit the...
sorry about that uh, for those of you who are watching online. We'll uh, catch up here later. All right, guys, I need you to go ahead, pull out your phones, um, if you have it, and uh, open up your Bible app. If you happen to have a Bible app, whether it's Bible Gateway or YouVersion, um, or if you have a physical Bible, make sure you have that with you. Um, I want you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. All right, turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Now, while you're doing that, I have a couple quick questions. You know, as, as we were coming back in person, you know, I spent a lot of time praying to God, kind of, how can I love on you guys? How can I minister to you? How can I walk with you through this? And one of the things that he's been laying on my heart is just kind of asking you questions at the beginning of the sermon. Um, just kind of seeing where you're at and seeing how are you handling all this. So my first question to you, where do you see yourself? As we sit right now, where do you see yourself in five years. I actually want to know your answer. Where do you see yourself in five years? Working, Working at your profession. Uh, Turning 18. Getting your, who said that? Getting your driver's license. 20 and you'll be doing the rodeo. Graduating high school and starting your career. Anyone who is watching online, go ahead and put it in chat for me. What, what do you see yourself doing in five years? Now, what, what about 10 years? I know that's a long way away from now, but what about 10 years? What are you doing in 10 years? President of the United States. You have heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. Clay Wright, President of the United States. I don't know what year that is. Exactly. Vote him. Although, he'll be too young to be president, but still. What? Living on a ranch. Hopefully not dead. That's a good thing to aspire to. Working at McDonald's. Air Force pilot. I like that. Still be in college by then. Right? Okay. There you go. Nice. Mm -hmm. Sweet. So, so starting your career. I like it. Well, look at, yes, one more, one more. Professional ballerina. I love it. No, that was it. So looking towards the future is something that we all have been doing since kindergarten. I mean, do you guys remember all those assignments you had to do uh, when you were young? When you're in kindergarten, they're asking you, what did you want to be when you grew up? You had like your little journals or something? Astronaut. There you go. What I have always found fascinating, what I've always found fascinating about our answers then and our answers now is the desire of our hearts. So as little kids, you know, we all want to be superheroes. We want to save people and help people. I mean, we may not want to be actual Superman, but, you know, we want to be doctors. We want to be lawyers. Maybe we want to be a mom or a dad. But the whole idea is about helping someone else. But then, then, we get older. And all of a sudden, our priorities change. And all we care about is money, or things, or status. And the truth is, this is no different now than it was in the time of Jesus. As little kids, the disciples, they wanted to help others. But then, as they became adults, they wanted to climb the social ladder. And we're going to see this. This is made evident in tonight's scripture. As the disciples ask Jesus a very blunt question, who is the goat? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So we're going to read tonight from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. And while you're still looking for that, Luke, let's go ahead and play our intro video real quick for me. The return to glory. I like the way that guy says that. That's exactly right. I wish. All right, with your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, listen 
to God's word. And if you don't happen to have it, it's also going to be up on the screen. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Will you pray with me? Abba Father, we want to thank you so much for tonight, for all the fun that we've had and for for the ability to, to come together. God, we pray that as you speak your truth tonight, that we can hear you, that we are transformed by by your word. As we leave here tonight, that somehow we are closer to you. That we set aside what we want and focus on what you want. Lord, take me away so it not be my message, but let it be yours. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Being a disciple of the world is like a young man who constantly invites himself to participate in activities with others. Who always comes over to your house and eats all of your snacks, but never invites you over to their house. He uses his charm and his wit and his humor to befriend everyone around him. At first, it works, captivating his audience and mesmerizing them into a false sense of security. But as his humor fades, people start to see him for who he truly is, a mooch, a leech. Eventually, he grows old and he's living all alone, with no one around to care if he lives or dies. Well, as sinful creatures, we, are all, we all have this inherent need to crave what we don't have. Being poor teenagers, even for those of you who do come from wealthy families, you personally own nothing in this world. Everything you have in your room, in your closet, and in fact, your room itself belongs to someone else. It is this internal sense of emptiness, that causes us to hunger for material wealth and possessions. But along with owning nothing, as teenagers, you also cannot affect any sort of real change in the world that you live in. I mean, come on, you're teenagers. What do you honestly know about how the world works? You have yet to live your life. Well, at least this is what some adults think and say about you. So just like our sense of material emptiness, we also suffer from an emptiness of purpose. I hear far too often from many of you guys and many of your classmates that you want to go to this school so you can get this degree to get this job because you can earn X number of dollars right out of college. Very rarely do I ever hear anyone say, I want to go where God sends me. I want to do what God asks me to do. Now, I want to stop for a second, and I I need you guys to understand, I'm not trying to call you out if this is your mentality or criticize you for the way that you're thinking. And honestly, you are simply a product of your environment. And you're not alone in this, though. I mean, we see this same exact situation playing out with the 12 disciples. And before I dive into our scripture, I want to share with you some very interesting information regarding the 12 disciples that I think that all of you guys are actually going to really like to hear. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever watched a Bible movie or TV show? Show of hands. How many of you guys have ever watched one of those? Like maybe Passion of the Christ or Bible AD? Excellent. So most of you guys have. Well, if you think back to those movies or TV shows that you've watched, think back to the actors that were chosen for the roles of Jesus, for the roles of the 12 disciples. And when you think about this, you might notice something very similar across all the movies and TV shows. They're all older, middle-aged men. In fact, many of them actually appear to be older than Jesus. But here's the truth. Those shows and movies are wrong. When you actually look at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have clear indication 
that they all were very young. Now, I need you to understand, their real age, we will never know. But based on decades of academic study, we have concluded that the original 12 disciples, they were just teenagers when Jesus picked them to be his disciples. In fact, the youngest was about 12 or 13 years old. The oldest being about 21 or 22, with Jesus being around 30 years old when he actually started picking them for his ministry. Whew, mind blown. You are the same age as the disciples were when they started following Jesus. And I'm the same age as Jesus when he first picked them. First off, this, this should be a life-changing revelation for you, as it now puts the Bible into greater context specifically for you. It is four Gospels, four books, written by teenagers for teenagers. And secondly, this is important because it reveals a lot about why they asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, being teenagers, just like you, they were poor, socially isolated from the rest of the world. Adults looked down their noses at them. I mean, come on, they were teenagers, so they were young, they were annoying, they were destructive, they were rude. The disciples were going through the same exact growth pains as you are going through right now. Now, what is really funny is how you can clearly see a group of teenagers in this same exact story, but that's found in Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37. It's going to be up here on, on the screen as well. Look, let's actually read that real quick. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what are you arguing about? But they kept, uh, I can't see that. But they kept quiet because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. We're going to go ahead and stop there. We're just going to jump forward there, there, Luke. Now, in this version of the story, the disciples are arguing about who is the goat. Now, whereas in Matthew, they just ask Jesus directly. Truth is, the Markin story sounds a lot like you. I can't tell you how many times I've heard you guys arguing just for the sake of arguing. And sometimes it is actually about who is the goat, who is the better tennis player, who is the better power lifter, better in band, so on and so forth. But to get back to my original point, as young disciples of Jesus, we're all far too often consumed with this world. And because of that, that perspective, it blocks our view of what is actually really important. As we grow up, our true focus and our true purpose in this life should be in the service and glorification of God through his son, Jesus Christ. Our thoughts, our words, and our actions all should fall in line more with what Jesus wants than what we want. You know, there's another time in the Gospels where we see the disciples more focused on themselves than on God. But strangely, this time it actually comes from their parents. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 24, and I can actually read this one in my scripture because I actually have it pulled up. We see the mother of James and John go up to Jesus demanding that her sons sit at his right and at his left. Let's, let's read that real quick. All right? This is Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 24. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two of sons of mine may sit at the right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or at my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, that's talking about the other ten disciples, they were indignant with the two brothers. This, of course, position of authority and prominence, sitting at the right, sitting at the, at the left, I mean, that's a very important place to be. Everyone wanted to be at the right or at the left. This meant, if you were sitting there, that you were important, that you had power and authority. 
But in the same story in Mark, it's not the, the mom who is asking Jesus. It's actually James and John themselves demanding it of Jesus. Put us at your right hand. Put us at your left hand. But in, in both of these stories, we clearly see blind, selfish ambition supersede the desire to serve Jesus. But also, in all of these stories that we have talked about tonight, we see Jesus answer each one in a very peculiar way. I mean, it can almost even be argued that his answers are radical. Jesus tells his disciples to focus on other people. <gasps> So shocking. I mean, of course, that's what Jesus always tells people. Love someone else over and above yourself is his response to them. And honestly, this is the very point about being a disciple of Jesus. Through him, we are taught, encouraged, and we're led to always love other people instead of being obsessively fixated on our own selfish desires. In the situation where the disciples asked Jesus about who is the goat, his response to them, care for others. He tells us to embrace little children, be like little children. In the situation where James and John demand seats of prominence, his response is care about God. And to end tonight's sermon, I want to share with you a little demonstration. And it's actually more of a thought experiment. And here's the thought experiment. You're out one night with your family having dinner at a restaurant. A gunman storms the restaurant and takes you and your family hostage. The gunman tells you he can give you one of three things. Kind of like a genie, I guess. But, based on how you answer, he might kill both of your parents. Now, his first offer is that he's going to give you all of his money that he has collected over his entire lifetime. This is totally in the billions. His second offer is to give you his private island he owns in the Bahamas. And lastly, his third offer is that he is willing to spare your family, but you must die. So which offer do you choose? Will you pray with me? Abba Father, I just want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the truth that you just shared with us. That the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is you. Help us, Father, as we continue to discern your will for our lives to, to not be fixated on ourselves, but to be focused on others. God, be with us tonight. Give us safe travels as we go home. Use the dinner that we're going to eat to nourish our body and give us a good night rest so that we can be energized to build your kingdom tomorrow. In the name I pray. Amen. All right, guys, I love you very much. We're going to go outside for discipleship groups. All right, so ladies, I want to encourage you to go ahead and leave first. And then, gentlemen, ladies first, ladies first, ladies first. Hey, thanks for stopping by today and checking us out. Uh, somewhere here on the screen, Google is uh, suggesting another one of our videos that you might like. Go ahead and click on that video, head over and watch it. If you like it, hit the subscribe button. Also smash the like button. And uh, as I said earlier, tick that bell icon so that you're notified every time that uh, we upload a new video or when we live stream our Wednesday night youth worship. If there's anything we can do for you, put that down in the comments below and I'll reach out to you personally to help you as best as I can. I hope you have a great day, and may God bless you. Bye.